This is the third Sunday of Advent here in California. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. You can sit down. (laughs) Brethren, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men. The Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. From St. John, chapter 1. At that time... The Jews sent from Jerusalem priests and Levites to John to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. (coughs) And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, No. They said therefore unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they that were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why then dost thou baptize, if thou be not Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there has stood one in the midst of you whom you know not. The same is he that shall come after me, who is preferred before me, the latchet of whose shoe I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethania, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. (coughs) Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. (coughs) In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. You can have a seat. So the this is the third Sunday of Advent. The introit begins with the words of St. Paul, Gaudete, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, Gaudete. And normally the vestments today are rose-colored, and normally in a normal church there would be <clears throat> the, the blasting organ playing, there would be flowers decking the altar, and mm-hmm. the theme of, of, of much joy because we are coming so close to Christmas. Mm. And the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas time, this is what this is the whole purpose of Advent, preparing for the first coming of Christ, but we're also preparing for the second coming of Christ, which is going to happen. The first coming was already done. Christ came as a baby, as an infant, shivering with cold in the manger at Bethlehem. And Our Lady and St. Joseph, after knocking at many doors, St. Joseph found no room for them in any of the hotels or inns in Bethlehem. So it was rainy, it was cold, it was December. And it gets very cold in those desert countries (coughs) in Nazareth and Bethlehem. And besides that, from Nazareth to Bethlehem was a, about an eight, five to eight day travel on foot and going over the, some of the hills and into the valleys. So it was wet and rainy and they were shivering with cold. And, they, and St. Joseph remembered, because he grew up there, St. Joseph, in Bethlehem, and he had many brothers. He used to go to this cave outside the town and go and pray there often. And he remembered that place, and he, he thought, well, there's nowhere else to go. We'll go to the cave. So it was a cave and a partly a stable. And there he tied up the donkey, and there was an ox in there as well. And so the breath of the ox and the breath of the donkey, especially the ox, that warm breath warmed the baby Jesus when Our Lady wrapped him and laid him in the swaddling clothes, because she was shivering with cold, so was St. Joseph. So he would be warmer next to the breath of the animals. And that was foretold by the prophet Habakkuk, that 
God would be found between two animals. And in Bethlehem, that night, the shepherds would see the angels telling them, go see the Word made flesh. And they would see also the heavens. It was a very bright night that night, very full of light. And the shepherds ran to see the Christ child. And then the, the little tiny baby Jesus, who was God, he had the full use of reason. Here he was, wrapped in swaddling clothes. He could hardly hold his head up. And yet, he being God is directing the heavens. And he's sending the star to, to pull together the three kings. And the three kings will come even from India, even from far off countries. So when, they, when the star led them and they, they found themselves together, brought together by the star, each following the star, then the star, the three became one. And the star led them from that day, 13 days from December 25th to January the 6th to the Epiphany. So our Lord comes humble. He comes meek. He comes as a little lamb to draw our hearts. Who's scared of a little baby? Nobody's scared. They're, in fact, you're drawn, you're, you're enraptured by the charm and beauty of a little helpless baby. So God became a helpless baby for us so that we are not scared of him, but we respectfully adore him and are drawn to love him because he so loved us. He first loved us. He created us. He created the whole universe in six days. The, the whole universe in creation is only about 6,000 years, not much more than that, 6,000 years. And when they find fossils of huge beasts that were all drowned in the flood of Noah. They find still skin and even bone marrow in the bone, which could not, it tells you that these animals were very young. They're not millions and millions of years old because all that, that soft flesh and jelly flesh would not last. Skin would not last over 6,000 years. So that's another proof that the earth is very young. And... God so loved us that he became man and he became a baby in order to die for us, to open the gates of heaven, because only the blood of Christ, only the blood of God who is man and man who was united to God could open the gates of heaven. It couldn't be the blood of the holiest man. It couldn't be the blood of all the goats and rams and animals of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, for 400 years, that's what the priest did. They would take a lamb, stab it through with a knife, and kill it. Or, in some cases, tie it up to a, a stake and drive a rump up through its, its rump up to the neck, and then another stake through the shoulders. And so you would, the, the high priest would hold that lamb for everybody to see, and it would be hanging on a cross. And when the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph went into Jerusalem every year after they got back from from, from Egypt for seven years. Imagine what went through Our Lady's heart and St. Joseph when they saw that lamb hung up on the cross and the priest would hold it high, dripping with blood. And Our Lady knew exactly, it's pointing to her son that will be the one sacrificed on the cross. So her heart was already bleeding with sorrow at those sacrifices in Jerusalem. And our Lord knew that was him. All the Old Testament pointed to Christ. Everything in the Old Testament prepared for Christ. Even the Greek and Roman culture prepared for Christ and the Holy Catholic Church that he would establish. For example, Mass is in Latin. That was the language of Rome. And it's a clear language. And Rome was a, a, a very developed culture of law and order. And these guys were great soldiers, very disciplined, and conquered the world. And they also built bridges that are still standing today. You can go to Europe and see bridges built by the Romans, and there's still cars driving over it today, solid as an ox. So the Roman culture will be used and, and baptized by the Catholic Church. And it was well prepared to receive the Redeemer. And same with the Greek philosophy. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, 
their wisdom will be used to explain the truths of the Catholic faith, the, the sound philosophy of, of Aristotle, which respects truth. And modern philosophy is deeply perverse, and it was condemned by Pope St. Pius X, such as Immanuel Kant, Descartes in the 1600s, Hume, Locke, all these philosophers who attack reality, because they say their famous question, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no ear to hear it, does it make a sound? And Aristotle says, of course it does, because things are real. And maybe there's no ear to hear it, but it, it crashes to the ground and it makes a sound. But the modern philosophies are so twisted, they will say, well, if there's no ear to hear it, maybe it doesn't make a sound. How do I know it exists? How do I know things out me, outside of me really exist? So it's really perverse. And St. Pius X called, actually, the, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant the heresy of the modern world. Kantism is the heresy of the modern world. Because Kant says, I can't be sure what, out, what is outside me. I can't sh be sure to know it, that it really exists. So it's really perverse. So Aristotle doesn't even question that. Our eyes see objects. Our ears hear noise. Our, our sense of touch touches real objects that really exist outside of us. It is the world God built. And that's the beauty of true sound philosophy, which the Catholic Church will baptize from the Greeks. So when Christ said, when I die on the cross, when I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So he will draw the best of the Greek culture, the best of the Roman world, the best of the barbarians even, of German, Germania and Helvetia and, and the, the, the great Celtic monks of Ireland and Scotland, all that will be baptized in the great Catholic civilization that was Catholic Europe. Europe was Catholic. Mexico became Catholic through Our Lady of Guadalupe, whose feast is tomorrow. And that was like a crash course conversion. Because in Mexico, they were really sacrificing for hundreds of years victims on these pyramids. And they're still down there. You can see the pyramids. You can still see the piles and piles and piles of skulls and statues to the different gods that thirsted for blood. And the sun god was the, the king of all the gods. And so he had the biggest pyramid and he thirsted for blood. And in one month, they had up to 80,000 victims. They were sacrificing victims that would take a, an adult male or a virgin girl stretch her down over the altar, rip open her belly, pull out the heart, hold it while dripping blood to the gods, and then chop the head off and throw the body down the pyramid. This was done, and it was witnessed by Cortez and the great Spaniards. And when they saw this, they said, wow, this is demonic. This is satanic. But they saw how the devil mimicked the Latin mass, the Tridentine mass. Because in the real Mass, what does the priest do? He holds the heart of Jesus to the Father. And normally the bells will ring at that time. We don't have an altar boy here today, but, but normally the altar boy rings the bells. And in the High Mass, it's, it, the, there's insensation to Christ. His heart is often to the, offered to the Father in the Mass. That's the Mass, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross made real for real, present on the altar. So when the Spaniards saw the similarities between the Catholic Mass and the satanic rituals of the Aztecs and the Mayas, they were, they were shocked. So the great Cortes, he made war, and with about 300 soldiers, conquered a city of three million. And it was only by the hand of God, only by the hand of the Virgin Mary. And he took a statue of Our Lady that he brought from Spain and put her up on the top of the pyramid. So not long after that, in 1531, the Virgin Mary would appear in Guadalupe. And the Indians, when they saw this tilma, the tilma of Our Lady, when they saw the tilma, they just fell to their knees, some of them weeping, because they could read it. Because the Aztecs were not barbarians dragging their knuckles. They had a very developed culture. 
They had built cities on rivers and lakes. They would read the stars and the constellations of the stars. So they could read the stars on her mantle and see that she is a queen but by the blue mantle. But she's not God because she's higher than the sun because she stands blocking the sun and the rays of light are behind her. She's higher than the moon god because she's standing on the moon. But she's not God because her head is bent and her hands are folded to someone higher. And they see the stars on her, on her mantle. They could read it, that they were exactly the constellations of the stars in the sky on December 12, 1531. And not, just, not looking from earth up to the stars, but from above the stars looking down to earth. And when they saw this, they just said, this, this is a queen, this is a deity, this is a, a woman who is raised above all, like a goddess, but she's not God. And Our Lady converted them. Through her, the priests were able to easily preach the Catholic faith, and they were baptizing people day and night. Their arms were falling off from all the baptisms. Over 8 million converted. And that was just the power of the Mother of God. So we're going to see something great like that again. The age of Our Lady. We're on the verge of her age. When she said, My Immaculate Heart will triumph. Russia will be the instrument to punish the world, especially our corrupt West, which just now passed the Disrespect for Marriage Act, which acknowledges marriage between two men and two women, which is an absolute abomination, not only to the animals who respect nature and to the angels who are horrified by this, but it's such a vice against Almighty God. And now it's been uh, passed by that horrible Schumer, and this will draw down punishment from heaven on the West. And it's prophesied, Russia will be the instrument to bomb out the West but Russia will be the, also the instrument to convert the whole world back to Christ the King, because Russia will become Catholic again, like Mexico, Mexico became Catholic. In the, and by 1601, they had a huge Catholic university, and they were sending professors to Europe. That's how, that's how high a developed culture became Mexico under the Catholic faith. So whatever our Lord draws to his sacred heart, it, it elevates society. When men go towards the Sacred Heart, everything is raised up from architecture, art, music, um, education, all the medical field. Everything improves under Christ the King. But when men turn from God, they become perverted, twisted, and use these good things against Almighty God and His laws, such as abortion, such as the Sodomite laws that are passed recently, and the whole gender trend gender, um, transgender nonsense. Uh, not, it's, it's worse than nonsense. It's foul corruption. And it's really leading these kids, many kids who step into this nonsense, they become suicidal. And then using, uh, uh, using in the parts of killed babies as ingredients in these toxic needles in the name of medicine. And people are dropping dead by the thousands every day from these shots. Every day, thousands, every day, young people, young soldiers. I was just told of a soldier that I know uh, in Arizona, a young 31-year-old girl who was in the military. She's just healthy, beautiful, <clears throat> promising. She just dropped dead. Wow. And another friend of his who got it, got the shot, he was healthy and strong. Now he's bleeding every time he runs. He's spitting up blood. And uh, he's blaming it on something else, but it's obvious the cause. Mm. So that's what happens when men turn from God. We, we become foul, corrupt, and worthy of punishment. And that's our modern age. Mm. So when Christ, when his first coming, he comes humble. And he always draws. He wants to draw our heart. He wants our love because he so loved us. And he will give us all the grace to get to heaven if we will keep his commandments and seek to love him above all things. But in the second coming of Christ, that will not be the infant baby anymore. It will not be the little lamb or Christ riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. 
It will be Christ in his glory and power and majesty. Christ as king. Christ as the high priest. And he will come in great power and majesty. Daniel, the prophet, says there will be fire coming before his throne. And the angels will blow the trumpets. And Christ will come and his wounds will shine for all men to see. And all the human race will be gathered before the throne of Jesus Christ. And everyone will be judged. Biden will be there. Pelosi will be there. Newsom will be there. All the human race, all of us, the whole human race will be gathered before Christ the King. And then the angels will go out and separate the sheep from the goats. And that day is going to happen. This is not fiction. It's not myth. It's not some nice story. It is reality. It's going to happen. So we want to live in such a way that we be pushed to the right side with the, with the sheep. And we got to pray to the Virgin Mary for that. Anyone who's close to the Virgin Mary is no, no one who, who loves the Virgin Mary prays to her, especially her rosary, <laughs> wears her scapular. No one goes to hell who is close to Our Lady. All the saints say it. No one is lost who turns to her because she loves us more than any mother loves her own children. And you know, mothers can sacrifice their life for their children and fathers. But her love for each is is million times more than that because she bled with Christ at the foot of the cross for the love of our souls. So she really loves each soul and doesn't want us lost. God does not want the death of a sinner but that he turn to him and live. And Our Lady is the one who brings us to her divine Son. So we want to contemplate these realities. The four great last ends, death, when we're all going to die, whatever age we're going to die, and whatever cause, we're all going to die. That's the punishment of Adam and Eve. But death is not a victor because we're going to rise again on the last day with the resurrected body at 30 years old and strong and healthy, and all the ladies will be beautiful, and the grace of St. Divine Grace will shine through their body, and they will actually shine with the light of sanctifying grace and smile. So you'll see St. Teresa, St. Agatha, St. Lucy, St. Cecilia. You'll see St. Bernadette. You'll see all the saints, St. Joseph. You'll see all those aborted babies, millions and millions of aborted babies, billions now. Over a billion babies have been aborted since the 1960s. They're all going to rise with their resurrected body. They're going to be 30 years old. 30 years old, and you'll see them all. And then, of, of course, the damned, those who go to hell, their bodies will rise also, but their bodies will suffer in the eternal fires of hell. So we want to turn to the Mother of God and love her and beg her to help us love Jesus Christ, her divine Son, with all our heart, and to prepare for these great things, death, judgment, the particular judgment, so as soon as we die, we're going to be come before the throne of Christ, and we will be judged, and it won't be that long. And our guardian angel will be saying, but he did this, he prayed the rosary, he was good to this person, he went out of his way to help that person, he prayed for the souls in purgatory, and don't forget, he let someone in traffic go ahead of him, and the angels will try to defend us, but the devil will also attack us and say, well, when he was 10 years old, he did this sins. When he was 13, he did those sins. When he was 16, he did those sins, and he was at this place and that place. And the devil's going to know all our sins. But if we've confessed them in confession, they will all be washed away by Christ's precious blood. So that's why we want to make good confessions, because Christ is the one who forgives us in that great sacrament. And then, of course, death, the particular judgment, the general judgment at the end of the world. So death, judgment, heaven, and hell will are the four great realities we must contemplate. All of us in this room and everyone in this world, we're going to be for all eternity either in heaven or in hell. <clears throat> and we have to make our choice now. So don't delay, says the Holy Ghost. If today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Run while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. 
So we want to convert. We really want to um, prepare for our own death and prepare that we, through the mercy of God, obtain heaven by keeping his commandments and loving God above all. When you love someone, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to offend them. And that's how we should treat God. We should never want to offend him. And if we trip up and fall into sin, that we could quickly come back to him by contrition and say, my God, I'm sorry for offending you. I'm sorry for whipping you on the, on the pillar of the scourging. I'm sorry for spitting on you. I'm far, sorry for nailing you to the cross by my sins. And our Lord is so good. He is merciful. He's quick to forgive. Always. He is quick to forgive. The scripture says, a contrite and humble heart, he will never turn away. So that's what we want to be, contrite and humble. Because after death, it's too late. It's too late. And for the damned in hell, it's too late. They didn't love Christ on earth. They didn't think of him. And when death took them, they weren't ready or they didn't want to be ready. And they died hating God, ignoring God. So, and there are many souls in hell. And there's souls of eight-year-old boys. St. Gregory the Great saw a five-year-old boy in hell. And God is not unfair. That boy must have had full use of reason and know what he was doing when he blasphemed God, says St. Gregory. St. John Bosco saw, saw boys in hell from all ages. Um, Sister Josefa Menendez saw a 15-year-old girl in hell, saw her burning in hell, cursing her life that she turned from God so quickly at a young age. So let's turn to God with all our heart. And today, very soon in the Mass, Christ, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, becomes for real. And like St. John the Baptist said, Ecce Agnus Dei, that's what the priest says when he holds the Holy Eucharist. Behold the Lamb of God, here he is, the living God in the Holy Eucharist, to feed our soul, strengthen us in this battle to get to heaven. So let's turn to the Mother of God and kneel with her at the foot of Calvary at this Mass, asking a great love of God, a great hatred of all that offends Him, and to never despair nor turn away from the great mercy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is a mercy, an ocean bigger than the ocean of mercy for those who turn to Him. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us for every course to Thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us for every course to Thee. And for those who do not have recourse to Thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.